if you're newer with us, we're just beginning uh, a new book study. We're actually in our second week now of going verse by verse through the book of 2 Corinthians. And this letter, all the letters are a little bit different, right? The epistles, sometimes we call them, it means letter. All the letters are a little bit different, but this letter and this portion that we're in, we're about halfway through chapter one. This section in particular can be very tricky for the Bible student to sit down and and outline and, and, and to study because we're looking at a piece of what has been uh, just, it's just a, a slice of what's been a lot of back and forth dialogue between Paul and the Corinthian church. He, ha- at this point, I believe, has been to Corinth at least two times uh, by the time he writes this. He has sent more than one representative to Corinth to kind of check on things and make sure things are, are going okay. And by the time we read this portion of scripture that we're in, uh, he possibly has already sent four other letters on ahead. There's been lots and lots of dialogues. And so we're only looking at, at one side and one piece of all of that correspondence. And so that can be tricky to kind of see what is going on and what's taking place. Secondly, it's tricky because this is a very personal letter. Paul is revealing a lot about himself, more, far more than any other book. Last week, if you were here with us, in, right from the get-go in chapter 1, he shared about some of the suffering that he was going through. And then, uh, as we saw, there's five things that we can learn from suffering in our own life, five things for us to glean. But he's been scrutinized by the church in Corinth, and they're not exactly happy with him. They're skeptical of him, and they're beginning to question whether, man, is he really apostle? Does he really have a right to speak into our life? Who is this guy anyway? Is he authentic? Is he genuine? And that is something that we all want. We all want to deal with real. We all prefer authentic, real, genuine things. Uh, you know, I made some popcorn a couple nights ago. We were watching a movie, and uh, I thought, you know what this needs is that spray butter. Like, the, I can't believe it's not butter, but we can believe it's not butter, right? It's just, it would have fit that usage very well, but I can't believe it's not butter is not butter. It's not the real thing. Uh, I remember as a kid, every once in a while, we would get fruit rings. It's not the same as Fruit Loops. They're not the same. They... You put them side by side and you can't tell the difference, but one is definitely not the other. Yakima, my favorite example of this, is not Palm Springs. <laughs> we, uh, I just, maybe you guys saw this. This was in the New York Post. Here's a, the guy, I should have had it up so you can put it on the screen, but this guy, he's in a Nissan Sentra, and I don't know, who's in Long Island. I'm not sure what his goal was, but he had like an air horn and emergency lights and his neon Sentra, and he pulled over a van. The van was full of detectives that were on their way to a, to a, what's the word I'm looking for? A sting. Yeah, they're, they're going to, it was full of people. So he was an imitation cop. He wasn't the, the real thing. We like real things. We like authentic. Genuine is always better than phony. Now, the dictionary defines authentic this way. Genuine, original, as opposed to being a fake or reproduction. Not false or copied, but verified, supported by unquestionable evidence. And so he begins now, we've made it as far as verse 12 in chapter 1, and he begins to show them that his ministry among them was authentic, that he had integrity, and that he's been straightforward with them. He's not not trying to hide anything from them. And so let's begin chapter 1, verse 12. It's actually Calvary Ellensburg's theme verse. Uh, That's why I'm wearing this shirt today. It's got the... So if you don't have a Bible, you can actually just follow... No, I'm joking. (laughs) For our boasting is this... Paul writes, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity, in godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. This, he says, is how we were 
everywhere, every person that we come across with, this is how we're treating them. We're treating them this way. But then he adds, for emphasis, he adds, and more abundantly towards you. Hey, we treat everybody with, with these things in mind. But when, when we corresponded with you, Corinthians, I know it doesn't feel that way right now. There's some, there's some angst between us, but we, we did this, but we turned it up to 11, even more abundantly towards you. And, but notice uh, these who are skeptical of him. He starts his response by saying, this is the testimony of our, my conscience, our conscience. He says, I have, I have a clear conscience in this. Now, if you've ever find yourself in a position where you're criticized or you've been called out or you're questioned about your motives and, what, and what, how you responded to a situation, maybe there's some tension in a relationship at, in your marriage or at work or with your kids or with your parents, uh, the, the best place to start is to seek the Lord on it. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my anxieties, see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me to the way everlasting. The first thing to do when we find ourselves in a situation like Paul is here, where people are questioning his motives, what are you all about, is to seek the Lord on it, and then run it past your conscience. Lord, what are you telling me in this? Is, is there something I should do? Paul wrote uh, for your notes in, in, in Romans 2, verse, verses 15, he said, the conscience either accuses you or excuses you. Lord, is this true about me, what they're saying? This is something that Paul asked himself. Is there something I need to do? Is there something I need to apologize for? Paul says, no, man, I've, I've checked with the Lord. My conscience is clear. When I lay my head on my pillow at night, I, I have a clear conscience. He goes on. That's so embarrassing. Everybody else right now is like, oh, silence the phone. <laughs> I actually had it happen to me while I was teaching up here one time. I would have thought, who would call the pastor while he's teaching? Somebody. So what we're going to see here, now that he says my conscience is clear, and what he's going to do, again, I encourage you to take notes, he's going to give us several marks of genuine ministry. And the first one, he says, the testimony of our conscience, we conducted ourselves and the world in simplicity. The first mark of genuine ministry is simply simplicity. It could be translated, and your, your Bible probably has a footnote that says this. It can be translated holiness or moral purity, but the word simply means there's no duplicity uh, there's, it's not two-faced. There's no hypocrisy. It's almost the opposite of hypocrisy is what this word means. It's not tainted. There's no hidden agenda. There's no, uh, you know, there's no ulterior motives going on. It, it is what it is, and it's, it's authentic. And Paul says, I, I wasn't one way in private and then another way with you. I, I've lived and, and I've acted towards you exactly how I am. I'm the real me. And this is important. Like We, we want to we go through and we want to look at these marks of genuine ministry and we want to apply it to our own life right because we're all ministers we all have a ministry and the first thing he says here is got to be real and that's so important the world is looking for real people <laughs> and we live at a time with social media and instagram and twitter and all that where real is a long ways from from what people are actually experiencing it is harder and harder to find things that are real. It's not in Hollywood. It's not in the music industry. It, it's, it's not in politics. Even our news is fake now, right? And you know what's crazy? Anybody seen the trailer for Gemini Man? Will Smith? There's some Will Smith fans in here, right? I'll admit it. I'm a Will Smith fan. Okay. He's got a movie coming out called Gemini Man where he's, he's fighting a digital him that's 30 years younger. Even the actors, now, literally, the actors aren't real. But we, we, people are looking for real. I mean, that's cool, and that's fascinating. There's another one coming out with Al Pacino, who's 79 years old, where he's going to play a young guy because they can digitally alter him to make him not real. It's crazy. But if people are looking for realness, they have to find it here. And by here, I don't mean within these four walls, although they should, but I mean here within the church. We're the church. We have to be real people. 
And as a church, as a ministry, ministering to people, we're not trying to manipulate. We're not trying to trick people into, into the door. I know I've shared this a couple times before, that this church back home where I'm from, they would give gas cards as a door prize to come in. Hey, this Sunday, you could win 100 bucks in gas. Let's, tr- let's just take that mindset and put it in the first century. Do you think, just for a second, that Paul ever said, hey, come to our meeting and win a bale of hay? <laughs> no. No, you're drawing them for the wrong reasons. There's a, there's a phrase around Calvary chapels that's great. It says, simply teaching the Bible simply. That's, that's all it is. That's what we want to do. Or uh, some of you guys know Pastor Dallas down in Calvary Chapel Toppenish. He's got a great little catchphrase that he uses. And it says, we are studying God's word from cover to cover to discover the world's greatest lover. <laughs> I love it, man. It's just, it's simple. There's nothing uh, out there that, that we're trying to hide or do. It's just simple. And if we want to have an impacting witness in our family, with our kids, at work, with fellow students, co-workers, we have to be real. We have to be authentic. We just don't put on airs. Don't try to be something you're not. We mess up, and we daily experience forgiveness in our life, right, Christians? And so we just share that. Hey, yeah, I mess up too, man, but, I, but I'm forgiven. God forgives, and, and, but there's hope found in him, and, and we just share in realness what's going on. It's just that simple. The second mark of genuine ministry, Paul goes on here, number two is godly sincerity. This word, uh, sincere, sincere here, sincerity, it's a great word in the Greek. Some of you have maybe heard this before. But the word literally means without wax or, or tested by sunlight. You see, in the first century, if you wanted to go down to the, the market and say you're shopping for a vase, shopkeepers who would have to take their wares out every day and set them up and then pack them up and bring them out, uh, they might chip something. Something might get a crack in it. And so what would you do? You take a little wax and you, 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 you fill in that gap or you, you patch that crack or you cover it up. And the smart shopper would take that piece, say you're looking for the, a vase, you'd take that vase or, or whatever, that piece of pottery, and you'd test it by the sunlight. You'd hold it up. Is there any wax in this? That's what the word sincere means. And so Paul is saying, this is the real deal. I am what I'm claiming to be. Now, this reminded me of a funny story uh, from my childhood. Well, I didn't know it was funny until about like, like two years ago. So <laughs> about the time I was born, uh, so my mom would have been 28, I think, a Bible salesman came around on foot to the front door lugging around this huge Bible. Look at this thing. You want to be holy when you go to church? You want people like to... <laughs> I like big Bibles and I don't care. <laughs> Look at that thing. Can you imagine? Everybody would be impressed with this, right? And my mom was impressed. Like, that's, that's a cool family Bible. And like I said, it's, it's, it's aged now, you know. But she bought it from this traveling Bible salesman, and years went by until she took a closer look in the front cover, and it says, property of so-and-so church, if found, please return to 2548 <laughs> South 6th Street, Tacoma, Washington. My mom bought a stolen Bible. I called her today, just this morning. I'm like, how, how long does that, even before I was born, I mean, it's been a long time, and so we were talking about it. She's like, you're going to share that in church? And I said, you better believe I am. She's like, well, what are people going to think the next time they see me? But you buy stolen Bibles, that's what they're going to think. <laughs> Mom should have held it up to the sunlight and seen what it said on the front page wasn't sincere. Look across, look across the page here to 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Paul kind of expands on this idea of sincerity and, and just this genuineness in the ministry. 2 Corinthians 2, 17, he says, For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. 
but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Paul says, I, I didn't teach the word with an axe to grind, or uh, I wasn't trying to make a profit. I'm not trying to impress anybody. Uh, I am what I claim to be. I'm just a messenger of Jesus Christ. There's simple authenticity. Number two, godly sincerity. Third, he says, not with fleshly wisdom. He says, my coming to you was not in the flesh. To be fleshly is to be self-motivated, self-governed, self-willed, self-centered. It's You're focused on you, the flesh. What does the flesh want? And he says, my dealing with you wasn't in the flesh. I wasn't trusting in my own ability or my own know-how or anything. I didn't run my life and my dealings with you according to some self-centeredness. That's not what my ministry is marked by. You know that. Instead, he said, number four, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. The, the fourth trait here, he says, of genuine ministry is it's grace-driven. Paul understood that the very best he could offer in the flesh was not enough. It was weak. Flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 real quick. And, and look at this self-evaluation that Paul made about himself. He says here in 2 Corinthians, I didn't come with fleshly wisdom. That's exactly what he says in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be or rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Can you imagine that on a resume? Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm weak, I'm trembling, I'm not very good with words. Um, it's, all, it's all the Lord. It's, everything is depending on him. And so Paul is saying, I didn't try to woo you with flashy special effects or neat PowerPoints or, or any of that, not even amazing oratory skills. I trusted in the power of God, and I kept the main thing, the main thing, and the main thing, as he says here in verse 2 of chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians, is that Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's where our hope comes from. It's not because we're so talented. It's not because we're so good. It's all because God is so good. Now, flip back over to just a little bit to the left of 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, I am, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. We've heard that before, but what an amazing incredible thing to say about your own life. You just let that sink in for a minute. The product of my life, I am what I am, cannot be separated from what God's grace has done in my life. It's inseparable. How I've interacted with you, how I've behaved towards you, it's inseparable. I cannot separate it from what God has done in my own life. His undeserved, unmerited, unearned affection and favor on my life, it's marked me. It's marked who I am. And so I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to, to be showy or flashy or put on a show. It's just grace. It's God's grace in me that I want to share with you. And this is a successful time at Calvary Ellensburg, if we can use the word success, that, that word gets used out of context all of time, all the time. But if, if you have leave here and you've been inspired by God's word and you leave more impressed and more in love with who Jesus is, that's when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as a church. It's not Tad, Pastor Tad is impressive. We all know that's not the case. It's, oh, Jesus is so impressive. He's so incredible. He loves us so much, even a sinner like me. Ah, oh, it's grace. It's grace upon grace. Paul goes on now, verse 13, and explains that just like that was his life, his, his, their letters his matched, his, matched his life. Verse 13, for we're not writing any other things to you 
than what you read or understand. Again, there's, there's nothing between the lines. I didn't write one thing and mean another. I've been straightforward with you. He goes on in that sentence and says, Now, I trust you will understand even to the end, verse 14, as also you have understood us in part, that we are or, or will be your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, my hope is that one day you will take as much pride in me and my ministry as I take in you and what God's done in you. I'm proud of what God has done in you. And I, I want this mutual boasting, this mutual affection. And we're going to see that throughout these next couple of verses. He said, this was my aim. This is my goal. This is what I want the end to be. This is what I'm getting at. That, that my hope is that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, we're going to be rejoicing together, just celebrating what God has done in and through each other's lives. And in this confidence, verse 15, in light of this mutual rejoicing that we're going to have one day, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Now, I think we have a, a map uh, or two to come up here. Okay, so uh, there with the circles, we have Jerusalem, Ephesus, Corinth, and Macedonia. In chapter 16, uh, we can get a little technical here real quick because this all plays into how they're interacting with one another. But in chapter 16, verses like 5 through 9, Paul says, here's my plan. My plan is to go from Ephesus to Macedonia because Paul is writing this from Ephesus. He says, I'm going to go to Macedonia, down to Corinth. And then he said, if you remember here a few weeks ago with us, he says, I want to spend the winter with you there in Corinth. And then I'm going to take the collection to the poor saints who are in Jerusalem. That was plan A. But plan B, as he says here, the plans have changed. And now there's, there's a different thing I intended. Now my plan was to go to Ephesus, to Corinth, up to Macedonia, back down to, Ep to uh, Corinth, and then over to Jerusalem. You guys understand? It's a little technical there, but what he's saying is that I wanted to, I wanted to get you twice. I wanted to get you on my way up to Macedonia and my way back. I wanted to be a, a double benefit to you, a double blessing. Now, that sounds good. This was Paul's intention, right? And, the, and the, the phrase that is good to remember and live by is that we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge other people by their actions, right? And it gets us into a lot of trouble makes us unloving people. Paul intended to do this, but they were judging him by his actions. And so the problem is they concluded that Paul didn't do this. Oh, you can talk about your intentions, but that's not what you did. And if we can't trust what he said about his travel plans, how can we trust anything else he communicates to us? He's an untrustworthy guy. And so Paul didn't have to explain himself. As he said here in, in verse 12 and 13, he says, my life, my, my letters, it's been full of integrity. Yet, graciously, he responds. And he responds by the use of uh, rhetorical questions. He says, therefore, therefore, this means in light of, let's tie ourselves back into what he said, in light of everything before, my sincerity, my desire to be a blessing to, want to each other. He says, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan to do, I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? He says, was this a casual thing that I was doing? All this travel, traveling back in the first century was not easy. He says, was this something flippant? Was this half-baked, spur of the moment? Well, I don't know if, if there's no real forethought to this. No, he says. This isn't a plan that, that came about in the flesh. Hey, I think I'm going to do this. He says, it's not like I didn't consult with the Lord. No, this wasn't fleshy. I'm not speaking out of both sides of my mouth. It's not yes, yes, no, no. I'm not vacillating. He said, this was serious. This was spiritual. There was a, there was a, my intentions were good. I wanted to give you a double blessing. That's, that's what was behind all this. But, verse 18, as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, <laughs> Because remember, remember the message that we had for you. We didn't go back and forth. We didn't have send mixed signals. We didn't waver. Our message was Jesus. And this is number five. 
uh, the, the fifth mark of genuine ministry is that genuine ministry is focused on Jesus. Verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, now he begins a, a parenthesis here, by me, Silas or Silvanus, and Timothy, that, that part's a parenthesis, so let's read it without that. Verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, was not yes and no. The Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah, Christ, he is not yes and no. But he says, in him was yes. We weren't peddling something else. We didn't waver. We're not out there, yes, yes, no, no. Because we had one message that we preached to you. And we already read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, we focused on Jesus. It was Jesus Christ and him crucified. We share Jesus, and Jesus is a resounding yes. That's who he is. Now watch this, guys. Check out this amazing truth in verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. This is so important for us to get. And maybe above anything else this morning, this is what I want you to, to get. All the promises of God are in, in him are yes. In who? Sunday school answer, right? It's in Jesus. In Jesus, the promises of God are yes and amen, or so be it. You do not have access to the promises of God if you are not in Christ. The promises of God are in Jesus. In the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, most of the promises, there's a lot of promises in the Old Testament, and most all of them were conditional. Over and over again, we're told that if we do this and if we do that, then God will do this. But in Jesus, the Apostle Paul says here, all the promises are not if then, they're not conditional, but they're yes and amen. Jesus has fulfilled all the conditions of those promises. He's fulfilled all the ifs that there are in all the promises. And since you and I as believers have been placed in Jesus Christ, we get all the thens. Isn't that amazing? He has done all of the work for us, and so we get all the benefit. We get all the promises. This is a great deal. Since Jesus fulfilled all the ifs of every promise, we get all the thens. The blessings, the promises of God are in Jesus. If you are here this morning and you need peace that the Bible promises, where is it? In Jesus. If you need joy, where is it? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's all in him. You know what's crazy? Consider this. D.L. Moody said, God never made a promise that was too good to be true. Isn't that great? Consider that the next time you're reading through the Bible and you come across a promise. The Lord has never given a promise that was too good to be true. God's promises, he's saying here, it's not, well, maybe, yeah, yeah, I don't know, depends. All the promises of God are available to you and I this morning in Jesus. The closer we get to him, the more we prioritize our relationship with him, the more we experience the promises of God in our lives. All the promises of God are in him, are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. What a great verse. Verse 21, number six, genuine ministry is spirit-filled. Now, he who establishes or confirms us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us his spirit himself in our hearts as a guarantee. And I, I believe that what he's saying here is that even though our plans don't always work out the way we want, right? And we all know that to be true. He, he said, even though that's the case, the plans and promises of God always do. He always hits his target. There's no promise that the Lord makes that doesn't reach its target. And so when God gives his followers his Holy Spirit, we know he's going to follow through on his promises. He's not going to give us his Holy Spirit and then pull up at the end and not, not have us reach the goal. 
And he says, uh, he has sealed us and given us a spirit. A seal, and most of you guys know this, it was an impression that was made in, in hot wax by usually like a signet ring, right? And that seal was a mark of ownership, number one. It was a proof that the document was genuine. And number three, it ensured that goods have not been tampered with on the way to its destination, right? You put them on a ship, it's sealed by the owner, and then when it, the, the ship comes into port on the other side, they can see, hey, everything's intact, everything is fine. And so when God, he says here, places his seal on your life, on my life, it's his way of saying, you belong to me, and you're going to reach the destination. If you have the spirit, there's no question about that. Now, he kind of picks up verse 23. Uh, he kind of went off on a tangent. You know, you and I, if we had travel plans that didn't work out the way we thought they would, I would just say, hey, man, I'm sorry. It didn't work out, you know, I had this. But with Paul, there's all sorts of theology. He's just explaining why I didn't get there, you know, and there's the theology. And so now he kind of comes back and says, uh, I did make serious intentional plans to come and see you. I wanted to provide you a double blessing. Moreover, verse 23, I call God as witness against my soul. He says, I promise you like, that God is my witness, that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. I intended to see it twice, but I, I came no more. Verse 24, not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. I see another couple marks of genuine ministry here. Paul says, first, not that we have dominion over your faith. Number seven, being in ministry does not equate to being in control. It's, it's not about dominion or dominating. I'm going to tell you what to do. It's not forcing. Ministry isn't about controlling others. He says it's actually about serving others. Not that we have dominion, not that we dominate you, but we're fellow workers or laborers or, or servants for your joy. This is the eighth mark of ministry here. Ministry is working for joy. And this is such an important part of what it means to be a leader in church, a leader in ministry, a leader in your home. It's to be a worker for the joy of others. Now, in 2019, we need to make an important distinction and remind ourselves that joy and happiness are not the same thing. We're not workers, parents, ministry leaders. We're not workers for their happiness. Happiness is feeling-based. Happiness depends on environment, what happens to you. It depends on, on, on finding satisfaction in the material world. But chasing pleasure will leave you with nothing. It won't even leave you with the pleasure when it's all said and done. The only thing you're going to gain by walking down further and further down that road of, of feeding flesh and pleasure is, is more emptiness and guilt and shame. Remember the prodigal, Luke 15, the prodigal, man, he left his, his family he went out, and where did he find himself <laughs> as a good Jewish boy? He found himself in a pig pen, eating pig slop. Chasing after the material will always take you farther than you intended to go and doing things you never thought you would do every single time. And so Paul he says, I'm not working to make you guys feel happy I'm a worker for your joy because joy is lasting. Joy is beyond emotions. It's beyond your situation. It's beyond your environment. It's a sense of well-being despite your circumstances. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we're after? Read Philippians. I love the book of Philippians. Philippians was written while Paul was in, in, in prison, and yet it's called the letter of joy. It's just so upbeat there, right? And can we agree, I'm thinking a little bit longer on this point, because all these points of ministry, and, and as I said before, we're ministers. We're ministers in our community. We're missionaries. We're either missionaries or mission field. And can we agree that our city, our culture, our county, needs an infusion of joy? We live in the wealthiest, yet saddest, and most depressed society in the world. 
Isn't that crazy? It's because we tend to focus on all the things that joy has nothing to do with. We focus on circumstances, on the environment, on feelings and emotions. Our church has had the chance to go on, on a lot of mission trips and to some third world countries. And uh, this is one of the things that if you've been a, on a mission trip to a third world country, that you really have to process through and think through. Uh, a couple of years ago when we were in Haiti, it, it got a got brought up more than once. Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the world. And yet, the, the team members found that they have so much less, but they had more joy. <laughs> then the people, we, we think of back home, back in the States, back in Kittitas County, people have so much, but there's less joy. Here, people have less things, but more joy. The poor, hungry, no real clothes, but they're beaming. Versus well-to-do, full belly, closet packed, yet they're a grumpy pessimist. And Paul's desire in his ministering to them is that joy should mark this. I, I, want, I want it to be joy-filled. It should be a hallmark of when believers gather together. Uh, there's a great missionary by the name of C.T. Studd, who got a pretty great name, I got to admit. He was a missionary to China and later into inland Africa. And he tells the story of former cannibals who were saved. And they had came to hear him teach one day. And as they headed back into their, their communities, into the jungles, as long as he could hear them, he heard them sing this chorus over and over and over again until it faded out in the distance. And it was, I love Jesus Christ. Jesus loves me. And nothing else in the world matters so abounding joy possesses me. Hallelujah. And it would repeat, I love Jesus Christ. Jesus loves me. And nothing else in the world matters. So abounding joy possesses me. This is where Paul wants to bring the Corinthians. And it's a challenge because as we've said before, they live in a culture very similar to our own. But this is who, if we're involved in ministry, we should be growing people too. And ultimately, this joy is found and bringing someone to trust and faith in God. He says here, workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Paul reminds the Corinthians, he reminds us that working for joy ultimately means bringing someone to trust in the Lord. You can't really have joy. You can't have this peace that passes understanding, this, this sense of well-being despite your circumstances, unless you know firsthand that the Lord's got you. You can trust in him. And so the joy that, it, that is found in trusting the Lord with your life, this, this walking in the spirit and living according to his promises, it's found in trusting in God. Now, one more thing before we, we head on here. We see this so clearly. If you were here for our study in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I'm a worker for your joy. But what is 1 Corinthians? What was that book all about? It was about correction. <laughs> it was about telling him, you got to get right. Sometimes being a worker for your joy, for others' joy, parents, means confrontation. Paul confronted them on the very things that they thought made them feel happy, but would never bring them like the prodigal to where they wanted to be. And so Paul didn't want to have to go through that again. He, he didn't want to confront them. Chapter 2, just a couple more verses here. But I determined this within myself. I, I didn't want to have that time of tension and correction and rebuke again. And so I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? And I, I want our time together to be reciprocal. I want it to, be, to just be joy, rejoicing again, over one another. Verse 3, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come to you, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Again, simply he's just saying, I, I want us to have this relationship be mutually joyful. And I didn't know if that would happen if I saw you again. I, I was afraid it would turn into correction. And so I just wanted to see you respond properly to 
the rebuke. I wanted, I wanted to see some repentance. I wanted to see you grow in your relationship with the Lord. I wanted to see joy return to your life. So, verse 4, out of much affliction, I didn't come and see you, this is why. So, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you. Instead of visit, I wrote to you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Last identifier, mark of genuine ministry, is abundant love. And I'll just tell you right now, as we continue to go through St. Corinthians, you can just keep this list going because there's lots of lessons on ministry. But the last one for us this morning, we're going to stop here, is abundant love. Now, let's take us back to the beginning of where we started this morning. The Corinthians had some intense negative feelings about Paul. There's no question. No, there's no commentator, there's no Bible scholar that will tell you otherwise. They had a beef with Paul. They questioned him. They doubted his sincerity. But what about what did Paul do here? He never stopped loving them. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Anyone can love someone that's loving them, but when you're loving people that are not loving you, when they're spiteful towards you, it's a good chance you're in ministry already. If you can love them back, that's ministry. So Paul, to close, he says, I, I want our time together, and I'm not joking, we are closing. That's kind of a pastor's way of making you pay attention a little longer, but Paul explains, I want our time together to be joy-filled. That should be, that's one of the characteristics of, of, of believers together. I want it to be joy-filled for both of us. But the way things have been with confrontation and correction, uh, I've had to give you, I didn't think that was possible. So in tears, but love, I wrote to you. But even all that correction, it was done in love, abundant love. And that's an important thing to remember too, right? A worker for a joy, but also abundant love. It's going to be willing to confront people. That's love. You know, it's the truth in love, right? I remember um, there's lo- when Charity was still Mormon, I spoke the truth to her, but there was a period of time where I was definitely not doing it in love. But when we can speak the truth in love, that's ministry. That's genuine ministry. And so, again, we're all missionaries. Everyone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ, he said, go, therefore, make disciples. Here's some things to mark that ministry that we have. Authenticity, sincerity, not fleshly, grace-driven, Jesus-focused, spirit-filled, not controlling, working for joy, and loving abundantly. Let's pray.